So why should we be talking about media today? Well, I think this sums it up pretty well. Congratulations, it's cable ready. I think maybe we should let the television hold him first. Today's kids are growing up in a really different environment than you and I grew up in. There are far more types of media than ever before in human history. Children spend far greater time with them than ever before in human history, and they have far greater access to all of them than ever before in human history. And as a developmental psychologist, we talk about this nature-nurture debate. What makes you who you are? Is it your genes or environment? Well, if, if we've changed the environment, in a way that's never been seen before in human history, I think that makes it a fair question. Might it have a different effect than we've ever seen before? Now, what's this child looking at? He's watching this music video. So, we learn from media even without trying to. No one told that kid, here's an educational video you should watch. <laughs> but clearly, he was learning just by watching. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, first of all, the media are powerful. In fact, they're far more powerful than most people want to imagine. So let me ask you a question about this. How many of you go past billboards on your way to work or uh, home? Just a couple of you, really? I don't Research has been done to find out how many, how many billboards you need to go past, or how many times you need to go past it before it has started to have a measurable influence on you. So I'm not talking about reading it out loud. I'm not talking about discussing it with someone in your car, or thinking carefully about it. Just how many times you're driving down the highway, you're going past a billboard, you glance at it out of the corner of your eye, notice it's there. How many times do you think you need to do that before it has had a measurable influence on you? Once, good skeptics here, I love it. Uh, it can happen at once. Uh, seven is way too many, actually. Uh, the advertiser's magic number is three. Advertisers will tell you the magic number is three. I'm conservative, the conservative number is four. After only four times past a billboard, if I asked you to rate how attractive different products were, or what you thought of these different products, or how likely you would be to buy different products, you would rate that one just a little bit higher than if you hadn't gone past the billboard. So here's part of the subtlety that we're talking about today. As you're driving down the highway, do you feel your opinions changing? Of course not. So it happens at a level we're not consciously aware of. Now, <clears throat> the media may not influence everyone exactly all the same way, but they do influence everyone. And one way we could think about that is to think about where children learn their patterns of behavior. Where do they learn their norms? What's acceptable, what's not acceptable? Well, they, the closest influencers to them are certainly the family. And the norms of the family, whatever is acceptable in that family, influences all of the individuals in that family. Outside of that level is the level of community, which you represent. And the norms of the community influence the families in it. They also influence all of the individuals in those families. Outside of that level is the level of society. And society, those norms influence the communities, the families, and the individuals in those families. And it's at this level that the media are operating. So the media don't just influence us one-on-one -on -one when we're watching them. They also influence us by affecting our families. They also influence us by affecting our communities. And this is one of the reasons why it's hard to notice when you've been influenced, because we tend to think that it should just be a simple direct one-to-one -one effect on us, but in fact it's much more complicated than that. So it's hard to notice when you've been influenced because you're being influenced in multiple directions all at the same time. Now, we are going to spend most of today talking about the power of the media influencing individuals, but that's not where I think the biggest effect is. I think the main effect of the media is to change entire cultures. Let me give you an example of this. In Mexico in the 1970s, there was a terrible problem with adult illiteracy. Too many adults couldn't read. The government realized if they wanted their uh, economy to grow, they needed to change that. So they instituted what were at the times really innovative programs. They put adult literacy classrooms right in the workplace, for example, so you could go uh, before work or on your lunch break or after work. They provided childcare in many cases, as you know. That's very important if you want low-skill people to gain a new skill. You've got to take care of their kids while they do it. They provided monetary incentives in some cases. Usually a powerful incentive for people, right? Well, no one went. All right, why not? 
Well, no one wanted to be seen walking in that door, right? It's not cool to, say, to admit, I can't read. So the producer of the most popular soap opera, Miguel Sabido, decided to try a little experiment. Here's what he did. For six months, he put pro-adult literacy messages into his soap opera. In the year following that little experiment, adult literacy enrollments went up 800%. There is the power of the media. It changed the culture from it's not cool to admit I can't read to it's cool to say I can't read and I'm going to go do something about it. <clears throat> now, we'll come back to this theme a little bit later, but I think the best way to think of the media, regardless of what your concern is, whether it's uh, effects on um, eating disorders and body image, on stereotypes, on school performance, on sleep, on aggression, it's one risk factor. It's one risk factor among many. It's not the biggest, but it's also not the smallest. And it works in conjunction with other risk factors to predict behavior pretty well. So let me now bore you for a while, talk about brain development. There are at least three principles of neural network development that are pretty well established at this point. They're somewhat oversimplifications, but in general they're true. The first is called the use it or lose it principle. The idea here is that the uh, neurons that get used get stronger and get kept. And the neurons that don't actually atrophy and get stripped away out of your brain. Uh, a neuron is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. And if you uh, don't use it, it atrophies. And this brings up the second principle, which is that there are, for certain types of behavior, not true for all, sensitive or critical periods of development. That if the brain's not getting the exercise it needs at those times, then those parts of the brain will actually uh, get stripped away. Uh, so for example, well, one of the behaviors this is true for is vision. Uh, and so studies have been done, you take uh, newborn kittens, uh, at birth, it suits your one eyelid closed. Now you don't actually harm the eye, you don't harm the eyelid, you just put a couple stitches in so it can't open that eye for a while. You leave them in for say two months, then you take them out, now the eyelid works perfectly fine. What do you think has happened? Yeah, the kitten is blind in that eye forever. Why? The part of the brain that was expecting to get exercise didn't, and so those neurons atrophied and got stripped away, or they got co-opted by other brain processes, and that brings up the third principle, that of brain plasticity. The idea is that it's always possible to form new neural networks. Uh, example of this is trying to learn uh, a second language as an adult. Uh, can you do it? Sure, if you're not me. <coughs> I've been trying to learn Italian for like 30 years now. Basically all I can say is, il mio italiano è molto male. My Italian really sucks. Uh, <laughs> But brain science tells me I should be able to learn a new network, a new language. Now, is it easier when you're a kid? You bet it is. But that doesn't mean you can't learn something new uh, later on. So here are slides of neurons from babies' brains. At one month of age, lots of neurons, but they're not all well connected because here's the nature-nurture part again. Nature puts all the building blocks there. What builds something out of it is the experiences the child has. So every time a child puts a block in her mouth, different patterns of neurons fire, and that wires them together and makes those connections strong. By three months, you can see they're sending out more and more interconnections. Six months more, 15 months, it's a dense thicket of interconnection. If we go a little longer, look at time. At birth, once again, lots of neurons, but not well connected. By age six, it is a dense forest of interconnection. And by adulthood, that forest has actually been thinned out a bit. How many of you deal with teenagers? All right, so this is an interesting transition here. This transition really starts happening at about uh, age 12 or so. Um, that uh, about that period of time is when children start being able to think in abstract terms rather than concrete terms. What do you have here? You have lots of redundant paths between things, between different uh, you know, parts of your brain. What do you have here? Just the best ones. So this has stripped out all the back roads and detours and left just the best, and we think that might be one of the reasons why teenagers start being able to think abstractly. The other thing that's interesting that you can't see on the slide here about teenage behavior mm -hmm. is um, the brain does not mature at the same rate across the whole brain. The last part of the uh, brain to mature is this prefrontal cortex, which I'm sure most of you know is where the impulse control areas of the brain are. 
Uh, so that doesn't mature until your mid-20s. Um, so what else is going on in teenage? Well, you've got all the hormones of puberty, et cetera. That's the, that's the gas. This part up here that's not mature, that's the brakes. Teenagers, all gas, no brakes. You now understand teenage behavior. <laughs> now, you've been lied to for the past 20 years, and the lie is the birth to three movement. When they say that from, age, you know, from birth until three years old is the most crucial period of time in a child's brain development. The lie, three. It doesn't stop at three. It actually continues. Uh, so neural network development is use dependent. The more you use these neurons, the stronger they get, the more likely to be kept. But it actually peaks at about age seven. If you look at, say, the brain use of glucose as an indicator of how much it's still building itself, it go, keeps going up past three to seven, stays high, and only starts dropping off in the teen years. So you put these two ideas together, and you realize that while neural networks don't just matter for things like cognitive skills, reading, math, language, problem solving, but they also matter for things like attitudes. We tend to think of attitudes as if they're not part of your brain. Well, they have to be. You couldn't have that attitude if it wasn't in your brain. And so if you, you put those together, you get this conclusion, which is children's experiences are a major factor in determining their attitudes, their values, and their patterns of normative behavior. Now, if you buy this conclusion, then it's fair to ask the next question. Well, what are the experiences kids are having? Well, children spend more time in front of TV than any other thing, except sleeping, and even that's getting to be a little closer <clears throat> competition. And that's TV alone. Now you add in cell phones and video games and tablets and all those other ways that you can connect to the internet or to content, and it's way more. So just on the basis of time alone, the effect of the media on children must be huge because of the way the brain works. The brain builds itself based on the experiences it has. And if this is the primary experience children are having, it's going to have an effect. So let's give you a few basic statistics. 99% of American households have television sets. That's more than have running water. It's more than have telephones. Tells you our priorities, right? The average household has, uh, with kids uh, has four TVs, three VCRs or DVD players, one digital video recorder, two CD or tape players, two video game consoles, and two computers with an internet connection. That's a lot of media in the average house. When you look inside children's bedrooms, 30% of babies have TVs in their bedrooms, 40% of preschoolers, and over two-thirds of eight and up have TVs in their bedrooms. Now, I don't know how many developmental psychologists you guys have interacted with, but we love to come up with technical terms to describe psychological phenomena. And developmental psychology has a very specific technical term to call this. This is what we know in developmental psychology as a bad idea. <laughs> now, yeah, I know technical language is complicated, but it sounds like an opinion. Let me give you data to back that up in a minute. If we look at how kids are spending their time, the average American school-aged child spends half an hour a week actively engaged one-on-one -on -one with his or her father. That's not just in the same room with the father, that means actively engaged in some activity or dialogue. The average American school-aged child spends two and a half hours a week actively engaged one-on-one -on -one with the mother, four hours a week doing homework, uh, half hour a week doing non-school related reading, and that may be a generous number. 10 hours a week on the computer, not for school purposes, 13 hours a week playing video games, and 31 hours a week watching television. Now, I have no doubt parents matter. Uh, they're, they're not getting equal time. They're not getting anything close to equal time. You add those up, that's 54 hours a week. The average American school-age child is in front of a screen. That's, that's a full-time job and 14 hours of overtime. And that's the average. That means half the kids are more than that. Now what's really changed in the past decade is about a third of the time they're on one screen, they're also on another. Those of you who have your cell phones in your hands right now or your computer up and you're looking at them, this is really bad for you, by the way. 
Um, so I'll, I'll, I wasn't going to talk about this data, but since so many of you are multitasking in this room, <coughs> uh, let, let me tell you what it does to your brain. Um, the great study out of Stanford, they brought college students, so smart kids, right? These are Stanford students. Uh, in, they asked them how much they do multitask during the day. They asked them how good they thought they were at it. Then they gave them a task where they actually had to multitask, pay attention to two things at the same time to be successful. It turns out the more you do it, the worse they were. The better you think you are at it, the worse you really perform. The more you do it, the worse you get. It's unlike most other skills where when you practice it, you get better. Actually, it's not. It's exactly the same. What are you practicing? You're practicing being distracted. And that's what you get good at. So you can't hold your attention on one thing when you want to. How many of you see this in your classrooms? How many of you see this in yourself? I do. I sit down to write a paper. I block out three hours of time. I finally have some time to actually work. Within five minutes, I'm checking my email. I don't want to be checking my email, but I can't stop. I've trained my brain to expect such constant stimulation that I can't just do a thing that I want to do anymore. Um, you've been watching TV for five hours. Turn it off right now and play your video games for a while. <laughs> you want your thumbs to atrophy? At least this dad knows his brain science, right? The use it or lose it principle. Now, I claimed that having a TV in the bedroom was a bad idea. On what basis do I make that claim? Well, if kids have a TV in the bedroom, add five and a half hours more to the TV number. That's by parent report. Parents underestimate how much time their kids spend watching television. When you ask the kids, it's eight hours more a week. Take the video game number, double it. Parents are less able to have consistent rules for children's media use if there's a TV in the bedroom. They're less able to monitor what children are seeing or hearing if there's a TV in the bedroom. Children participate in fewer alternative activities to electronic media, so they read less, they have fewer hobbies, they play fewer sports, they go to the library less, um, they play fewer games, they become a less interesting person. Uh, now maybe those don't really interest you, here's one that will. They get worse grades in school if there's a TV in the bedroom, and their risk of obesity, by the way, goes up 31% just by putting that box in the bedroom. Every parent is going to be faced with this question. Every parent is going to be begged for a TV or video game system or computer or an iPad or to keep their mobile phone in their bedroom. There is a simple two-letter answer in the English language. What is it? No. no, that is correct. Now, people are always saying, oh, it's so much worse than it used to be. I treat every time someone says that with a lot of skepticism because every generation for thousands of years has said that. Uh, kids these days. So let's look at actual data. In 1950, there were 168 hours in the week. That hasn't changed. <laughs> Thank God we never went metric. Who knows what it would be? Uh, now, if we assume that kids were getting too little sleep, which actually isn't true for 1950, but let's just hold a constant at too little sleep at seven hours a week. The research shows kids need about nine to 10 hours a day. Uh, and then let's assume all things you could do for your personal care, uh, bathing, dressing, eating, things like that, take up another three hours a day. And school is about 30 hours a week. That means kids in 1950 had 68 hours to do everything else. So that could be having hobbies or playing with their friends, spending time with their family, reading, uh, playing on sports teams, going to church, uh, taking music lessons, whatever it is, anything else you would want to do has to fit into that remaining 68 hours. And that's how much time kids had in 1950. By 1980, TV was cutting into it 14 hours a week, 2028, now it's up at 31. Video games are now up to 13 hours a week, computer up at 10 hours a week. That means the average American school age child today has 14 hours a week to do anything of value. And that's the average again. That means half have less than that. So it has changed. Now that doesn't necessarily need to be bad, right? Because there's lots of research showing that media can have very positive effects on kids. Uh, some shows, like Mr. Rogers, teach nurturing behaviors and sympathy and empathy, uh, it's persisting in a task when it's difficult, uh, able you know, to talk about your feelings and your interior world. I mean, those are actually all useful things. Um, some shows that target specific behaviors, like reading or math, very good at those. 
Uh, Sesame Street has the best metrics on it. I don't know if you remember, but in 1969 when Sesame Street was created, uh, or 68, I forget which, uh, the, uh, it was designed as a Head Start program. It was designed to bring the kids in the inner city up to the same level of basic skills as their white suburban counterparts. By the time they hit kindergarten, they have the same numeracy and literacy skills that uh, the suburban kids had, so to e even the playing field. And it turns out it's fantastic at that. It, the research documents that it really does an excellent job at that. But it's not just that. It turns out that if you watched Sesame Street for an hour a day as preschoolers, you're still getting better grades in high school. That's how powerful this effect is. It sets the kid up on a good trajectory, gives that ball momentum, and you can still see the momentum of that carried through 12 years later. Now when people hear this, they often say, well, how about Baby Einstein or programs like that that are targeting babies? Are these good for kids? And it turns out, no. Not a bit. There is no scientific evidence that suggests they have any benefits for, any, for children under, two or under. And the research also shows they may have serious harms for babies. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, their recommendations, uh, they recently changed them, but I kind of still like the way they phrased the old ones. No screens until age three. Seems kind of extreme. You know, huh? Then one hour a day total screen time for elementary school age kids and two hours total screen time. Total means TV, video games, DVDs, you know, all of it, add it all up. No more than two hours. Now this is for entertainment purposes. If you're using the computer things for school, that's fine. That's free. You get that free because that's enhancing your work. Um, why do they make the recommendations that severe? Well, um, let's ask Einstein. He said if you want your child to be brilliant, read them fairy tales. If you want your child to be more brilliant, read them more fairy tales. Why did he say this? Well, when your preschooler or your baby's on your knee and you're reading a fairy tale to her, what's she doing? Imagining. The brain becomes what the brain does. The neurons that fire together wire together. You practice imagining, you get better at it, right? Adults who are imaginative, they can think up things that have never been thought of before. Um, we have special words for them. What do we call them? Creative. We go beyond that. Genius, yeah. Genius. He's absolutely right. And the research does show this, that the single best predictor of IQ after genetics is how much children read, not what they read, how much they read. The single best predictor of what they read, or how much they read, I mean, is how much they were read to as babies. <laughs> this is the best use of media there is. From the time your child is born, spend time reading to him or her, and usually the child will grow up to be a pretty voracious reader and be much more likely to be brilliant. Uh, there is evidence as I said, that in fact watching these infant directed videos can harm your children. Uh, one study of a thousand families found that reading once a day increased babies' language development. Uh, you know, 10 percentile, that's a lot, right? Telling stories to the kids increased their babies' language development 7 percentile points, and each hour of viewing baby videos decreased their language development 17 percentile. How many percentiles you got to drop before you're put into a really different level of class? Um, and that's for each hour. For, so the kids who did multiple hours, you keep notching it down. Now, I was asked primarily to talk today about media violence and uh, video game addiction. So that's what I'm going to be spending most of the rest of today on. Now, one of the problems is that when we talk about aggression, we usually only, in the society at least, we usually only talk about it in relation to a horrible you know, tragedy like school shootings. And when that happens, we always ask the wrong question. We ask, what was the cause of this? The problem is there's, that's, that question's wrong. You cannot answer that question, and any answer you come to from that question will also be wrong, because aggression is multi-causal. 
We are more complicated than that. You do not do the things you do for one reason. You do not do everything you think. Thank God. What do we mean by aggression? Well, aggression is defined as any behavior. So that could be a verbal behavior. That could be a physical behavior. That could be a relational behavior. Um, that is intended to harm someone else, and that person, uh, if they knew about it, would not want to be harmed. It's a nice, clean definition. People like to claim, oh, you can't even define violence and aggression. That's not true. It's very well defined. Uh, this, this makes it clear. Most sports, not aggression. You know, that coach who says play aggressively doesn't really mean aggressive. He doesn't mean go out and harm the people, because if you do, you're usually thrown out of the game, right? Um, and so most sports, not aggression. Accidents, not aggression. Acts of God, not aggression. Uh, sadomasochism, not aggression. Because uh, then it's wanted by the victim. Um, so it's a pretty clean definition. And we could apply this definition to the media. And usually it's applied to, these are the typically uh, discussed bad boys of the video game industry, like Manhunt and Grand Theft Auto, which as you can tell are pretty photorealistic uh, depictions of violence. But it would also count for this, where, like in this game here, you're a little, this little space robot, and you go around and you shoot at things, and they don't bleed, and they certainly don't scream in pain, they just disappear. But if you could have asked the you know, motivations of the character that he just shot, you know, that it would not have been wanted to be forced to disappear, right? So uh, even these cute, happy, bright color, happy music games can count as aggression if what you're doing is intending to harm the other creatures in it and they presumably would rather not be harmed. Now, how could we decide if media violence actually influenced people? What would we need to know? If they were identified? If they what? If they identify with a particular aggressive character, yeah, that's a very intelligent uh, point. That's, uh, and it turns out that when we identify with a character, we are much more likely to be influenced by that character. And so if the character you're identifying with is uh, being aggressive, you start taking that on as part of your identity too. Um, this is one of the reasons uh, people have believed video games might have a bigger effect than other media. Like if you're watching a violent movie, if you identify with the victim, your risk of aggression actually goes way down uh, than if you identify with the aggressor. But how, would we, how else would we know whether media violence actually influenced people? How would we want to study it? You'd want to see that there's an actual link between playing video games or watching media violence and actual violence. Sure, so you'd want to see if there is a link. Now there are lots of ways we could study that link. We could do it with uh, surveys where we can see how much media violence they're consuming and then see their actual behaviors in the real world. Uh, and we do find, in fact, that it does happen that way, but that doesn't necessarily prove causality. Dreams and nightmares? You could, yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, we wasn't going to talk about this today, but the single biggest effect of media violence tends to be fear. We tend to think of it in terms of aggression, which is what I'm talking about more today. But in fact, the biggest is that your kid gets scared. You get scared. That's actually the first effect. Uh, and then over time we get desensitized, right? And it doesn't scare us quite as much. Uh, but we could do experimental studies where we randomly assign people to watch this show or that show or this game or that game, then you know, give them an opportunity to behave aggressively. We could follow kids across time and see whether uh, they're aggressive. Um, once we knew some of the answers from these studies, would you actually want to believe it? Most people really don't want to. You kind of want to know in the same way you want to look at that car crash. Uh, but you also kind of don't want to know the same way you look at that car crash, right? Uh, you, we don't want to believe that maybe we could be being influenced or our kids could be being influenced. It's always someone else's kids. Do you think there might be other people who don't want us to believe it? Yeah, producers of it. In this country, by the way, 85 to 90 percent of all media are owned by five companies. That means the same company that owns the video games owns movies, music, magazines, newspapers, television stations, radio stations, all the news channels you listen to. Why would their news channel tell you something bad that would hurt the profits of one of their other divisions? Uh, I've had the video game threaten to sue me. They just kept me out of President Trump's 
Uh, I got vetoed from being out in President Trump's meeting on video games uh, and aggression uh, two weeks ago, which was kind of cool. It's kind of a badge of honor when I'm so dangerous that I'm not even allowed to a meeting. <coughs> uh, but they have all the money, right? I'm a state employee. You know, and this is a 20-some billion dollar a year industry. They don't necessarily want you to know what the science is. So let me give you a true example. Let's imagine that rather than uh, all the different careers you have here, whether you're a school counselor or, or nurses or teachers uh, or other health professionals, let's imagine you are advertisers. And I've asked you down here to our fabulous conference room because we've got a super new client and we've got to come up with a terrific campaign for our client. And our client is cigarettes. Do we have an easy job? No, we have at least five problems to overcome. First of all, do you have an inherently attractive product? No, it stains your teeth, gives you bad breath, people tell you it's going to kill you. It's not usually something you look for in a product, right? You know, which of these shampoos will kill me better? <laughs> maybe motorcycles, maybe, you know, maybe that's the product where, where we've got a secret death wish anyhow, and that's underlying why we buy it. Um, but yeah, usually that's not why you're looking for a product, right? Okay. We're pros, we can overcome that problem, that's nothing. Problem number two, well the two most powerful media, radio and television, are banned from your use. You can't advertise the two best ways there are to advertise. Whew, that makes it a lot harder, but okay. We're pros, we're cool, we'll overcome that one. Problem number three, well your product, when used as directed, kills 400,000 customers a year. You've gotta get 400,000 new customers a year just to stay even. Ooh, that's a lot harder. Problem number four? Well, research shows that only one out of five adult smokers began as an adult. That suggests that you've got a much better chance of hooking children. Well, there's problem number five. Is it legal to market cigarettes to children? No. So you don't have an inherently attractive product. You can't advertise the two best ways there are to advertise. You've got to get 400,000 new customers a year just to stay even. You've got to market your product to children, but it's illegal to do that. This graph shows estimated sales of Camel cigarettes to children. In January of 1988, it was estimated $6 million worth of Camel cigarettes were sold to children. By July of 1989, that number had risen to $476 million. Who remembers what happened in this intervening 18 months? Joe Camel, Joe Camel was introduced. A cartoon character. He's smooth. He's cool. He smokes. Hey, kids, come smoke. Now, Media violence effects are one of the most studied things in all of psychology. Hundreds upon hundreds of high quality studies have now been done. We know the answer. It, the question is not, is there an effect? There are 19 scientifically documented effects. I will boil them down to four for you. The first one is called the aggressor effect. The idea here is that the more entertainment violence you watch, the more willing you become to behave aggressively when provoked become a little meaner, a little uh, more willing to say the unkind thing or push back. Um, the second effect is the victim effect. Simply put, the more you watch, uh, the more scared you get of the real world, sometimes called the mean world syndrome. You start thinking the world is a mean and scary place, so you start initiating more self-protective behaviors like uh, locking your doors or carrying a gun to school, which ironically increases your odds of being shot, especially if we arm teachers. Um, the third effect is the bystander effect. Simply put, the more you watch, the more desensitized you become. Now, I don't just mean desensitized to other media violence, although that's true. It also desensitizes us to aggression in the real world. So a classic study brought college-age men into a laboratory, randomly assigned them to watch either, I think it was 20 minutes of a sports program or 20 minutes of a movie that included a simulated rape scene, and then they brought in a woman who had really been raped and the men who saw the movie with the simulated rape scene were much less empathetic towards her, much more apathetic, much less sympathetic to her real human suffering and pain. 20 minutes changed the way they interacted with a real human being. That scares me. And the fourth effect is the appetite effect. Simply put, the more you watch, the more you want to watch. There is no question in scientific psychology about these effects. The question isn't whether there's an effect. The question is much more interesting than that. Which of these effects are you most likely to get? In general, boys tend to get more a combination of aggressor, bystander, and appetite. Girls tend to get more the victim. But everyone is influenced in at least one of these ways. 
here's the Hollywood executive. These kids gunning down with other kids in their schools could desensitize people to some of our movies. Some people are concerned about this. Now, what about the flip side? Because, as I said at the beginning, it's not that media are bad, they're powerful. What if we used that power for benefit? What if kids watch pro-social shows where you care about other characters, care about their feelings, show empathy, take care of them? Turns out when you watch those types of shows, there are two main effects of that type of programming. The first is a pro-social effect where kids who watch these shows are more helpful and cooperative. And there's an anti-violence effect. Their aggression is reduced. And again, these are not just short-term immediately after watching the TV, although that's true. Kids who watch these types of programs at home show these types of behaviors more in school. Now, what if you mix these two messages? Like every superhero, right? Who does violent things for pro-social ends. Well, if you take young kids, by which I mean up to about age seven or eight, and you put them in a room and have them watch a show that has only pro-social acts, and then you turn them loose in a room with other kids, and you just count their behaviors. They tend to show more helpful behaviors than hurtful ones. That makes sense, right? All right, what if instead you show them shows with only aggressive acts and then turn them loose in a room? Now they show about equal numbers of helpful and hurtful behaviors. But if you show them shows with both pro-social and aggressive acts, now they exhibit more hurtful behaviors than helpful ones. Why? Well, this is a complicated mixed message we give kids. Let me break it down for you. Let's, you know, any superhero, let's pick Batman. Here's the simplest you can make Batman, by the way. We socially sanction Batman's limited act of aggression on this alleged criminal perpetrator because by removing the alleged criminal perpetrator from society, we reduce either a greater number of aggressive acts across time or across people, and so that's why we socially sanction Batman's limited act of vigilante aggression. That's a complicated idea. Little children can't do that. Little children understand Batman is good, Batman hits people, therefore, hitting people's good if you're the good guy, right? Well, we all think we're the good guy. September 11th terrorists thought they were the good guys too. Now, once you get to about age eight, kids can start understanding this mixed message. But what's interesting to me about this is this means that everything we do from our best intentions as adults is wrong. We choose programs with our advanced cognitive skills, right? We look at it and we say, oh, it's got a good message. You know, I, the bad guy goes to jail, justice is served. Children can't understand that. They do not understand, young kids don't understand plot at all. Great studies, you take shows, you chop them up and randomly re reorder them. Kids can't tell the difference. They really have no idea how the beginning of the show relates to the middle of the show, relates to the end, and they certainly can't do that complex cognitive thing you do where you rewrap what you saw before with this new information that you got at the end. So if they're watching half hour of a superhero show and there's 28 minutes of fighting and there's two minutes of justice is served, what does the kid learn at a ratio of 28 to two? Fighting is exciting and fun. And two minutes of, yeah, it's bad. So we choose shows thinking they're good for kids and we almost always choose wrong because we can do things cognitively they can't. Now, why are you, we have no sound, there we go. Television is always actively teaching something. This is a little pseudo-experiment we did when I was director of research at the National Institute on Media and the Family. Always, to prove the point, we brought our television to the Blue Laws Daycare Center. About 10 kids, every two to five years old. And over two days, we watched them watch us. Can you say okay? We wanted to see if different kinds of programs would get kids to act in different kinds of ways. We had the room rigged, so while they were watching the monitor, the monitor was watching them. We had cameras and toilets, toy boxes, and on the other side of that one-way mirror over there. All these cameras and pictures to TV screens upstairs where we sat with their parents and David Walsh, a psychologist who also runs the National Institute for Media and the Family. It's at the age that these kids are that they're like sponges. They're learning constantly. All day long they're learning. On the first day, we had the kids watch Barney. Oh, please, please. The popular public television. 
television program with the big purple dinosaur. Are you ready for the next letter? The target two to five age group is drawn in new complete. <laughs> Now, there are two things that fascinate me about this. The first is the use of the word again in the sentence, Carl, you're going to get rug burn on your face again. <coughs> and the second is little Hannah. Why did little Hannah start punching and kicking? Did TV make Hannah start punching and kicking? No? What, what did? Peers, peer pressure, other kids, yeah. All right, what made the other kids start punching and kicking? TV. This is one of the rare opportunities you get to see the multiple layers of the effect in action. For most of the kids, it was a simple, direct thing. They watched it, they started copying it, but not little Hannah. What changed for her was her community. One day, what was acceptable, normative behavior in that room was sharing, caring, polite, respectful behavior. The next day was punching, kicking, aggressive play. What changed the norm in the room? Television. And that was powerful enough to bring everyone along with it. It also teaches us something about the nature of peer pressure. We often ask things about kids. Why do kids smoke? And we say, peer pressure. And we stand back smugly as if we've said something important. That doesn't answer the question at all. Because I promise you, with smoking, no peer came up with the idea of growing tobacco, drying it, processing it, infusing with chemicals, wrapping it in paper, lighting it on fire, inhaling the smoke and thinking that's cool. No peer came up with that idea. Where did they get the idea that it would be cool? 
and many times when you ask that question, you're back to the media. So from now on, for the rest of your lives, if you ever hear yourselves utter the words peer pressure again, I want you to kick yourselves <laughs> and go one step farther. Then where did the peers get it? Now, in a report to Congress, the United States Surgeon General said it is clear that the causal relationship between television violence and antisocial behavior is sufficient to warrant appropriate and immediate remedial action. There comes a time when the data are sufficient to justify action. That time has come. Anyone remember U.S. Surgeon General Jesse Steinfeld in 1972? I told you, this is one of the most studied things. We've known the answer since 1972. Not only that, there are two U.S. Surgeon Generals, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American Psychological Association, and others, all on record saying the data are clear. <coughs> Media violence causes, they use the C word, that's a big deal in science, causes aggression in society. And you haven't heard that. You still think we don't know. Why? Wait, where do you get your information from? The, the, the media. Yeah, the whole internet's controlled by these companies too. <laughs> Everything on the internet is true. <laughs> all points of view, sure. Uh, <clears throat> but not all of them are science. Now, we might say, okay, so um, how do we actually know that the effect is uh, you know, one way or the other, right? It might be that aggressive kids seek out media violence. That's true, by the way. They do. And that it's not really that media violence makes kids aggressive. So in the single uh, best long-term study that's been done, they're actually now uh, following up with the grandchildren of the original people. But they followed kids starting from age eight. I'm just going to tell you until they were 30. Um, the kids who at age eight uh, were measured to see how much TV violence they watched and asked the peers how aggressive were all the kids in the class. So they actually know who's the aggressive kid. And it turns out that the kids who watched the most media violence at age eight were also the most aggressive kids at age eight. But that doesn't disentangle what the direction of the effect is. You follow them up, however, out to age 19, and it turns out that if they had watched a lot of violent TV at age eight, they were now more aggressive at age 19. But if they were more aggressive at age 19, they were, did not watch more media violence at age or at age eight to age 19. And when we follow them out to age 30, the boys who had watched the most media violence at age eight were now incarcerated for violent crimes. We know the effect, we know the direction of the effect. Why don't you know about it? Well, first of all, we tend to misunderstand what causality means. We tend to think that there's a the cause, and that already will make us uh, miss the boat a lot of the time. And so, similarly to smoking, two-thirds of smokers don't get lung cancer. Does that mean it has no effect? Well, no. If you, know, if you open those lungs up, they aren't happy. They just didn't have enough other risk factors to get the disease. Uh, smoking is not the only thing that can cause lung cancer, but it is an important one. And the first cigarette, probably you didn't have a good experience. Uh, for those of you who kept smoking, you know, you became desensitized to it. Now, similarly, not everyone who watches media violence does something aggressive, and media violence is not the only thing that causes aggression, but it still is a scientifically documented important one. And usually when kids first see media violence, they don't like it. They're scared by it. They have nightmares. But then we again as adults do the wrong thing. I'll just pick on myself. My daughter, when she was four, I was sick to death of watching that Barney video. So I picked something that I thought would be more interesting to watch over and over and over again, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> Beautiful film, fun music, great story. Um, what I forgot with my advanced cognitive powers is that there is a child catcher in it with a really long nose. Adults look at that and we think that's funny. Children look at that and find it terrifying. What scares kids is different than what scares adults. And so she runs immediately behind the chair and is peeking out at it. And I find myself saying what every parent always says. What did I say? It's okay. 
it's okay, it's just a movie, it's not real. Okay, let's unpack that. That's cognitive information. It's a movie, it's not real. Abstract cognitive information. I'm giving to a four-year-old to deal with an emotional issue. Cognition and emotion don't talk to each other very much, not even as adults. You know this. You're lying in your bed at night, you're just falling asleep, you think maybe you hear something that uh, means someone's in your house, and now you're scared. And you can say to yourself, no, I remember locking the doors and locking the windows, so no one can be in my house. Does that make you not scared? <laughs> no. So even adults can't do that. Why do we do this to kids? What does it mean to a child when you just say, it's okay, it's not real, it's only you know, TV or a movie? What you're really telling them is shut up, sit there, and start desensitizing yourself to learn to like it. <coughs> we are the problem. I don't like saying that because I think every parent wants the best for their child, wants to do the best for their child. The problem is we don't understand what it was like to be a child. You can't. That's the whole point of stages of cognitive development. Go back and read your Piaget. Uh, you cannot think like a four-year-old anymore once you're out of that stage. And so we use the stage we're in to think everyone thinks like this, and we do a lot of things wrong as parents, very unintentionally. Now, the short-term effects of a, one cigarette evaporate pretty uh, much, and you don't get cancer just from that one. Similarly, the short-term effects of any violent program or game, you know, they wear off after about 30 minutes and doesn't usually cause any serious aggression right after it. But if you keep doing it over and over, the effects can be severe. And in the long fight between science and the tobacco industry, where the money was, made sure that you didn't hear the truth for about 20, 30 years after it was known. Similarly, you're not hearing the truth about the science on media violence. Some of my colleagues did this great meta-analysis. They averaged what newspaper and magazines tell you about the strength of the relation of the science on media violence and aggression. Interestingly, before there was any science, uh, it's, they didn't say there was none. News and reporters still didn't say there was no evidence of any effect between them. Uh, but this is it before there was evidence. And then as the evidence started building and building, they started saying, yes, you know, there it does look like there's an effect. Uh, and at the 10, it would be true, you know, what the U.S. Surgeon General said, which is it's clear there's a causal relationship. They never get that far. But over the past 30 years, they've actually been dropping in what they say. Here's how strong the data have gotten over that time. You put these two together. As the data, scientific data are better, the news reports are telling you it's worse. Now, I don't want to bore you with data when I could do it with theory. <coughs> so... I'm going to move into video games. This is the modern aggression theory. Um, it says you come to every situation with who you are. All your past history, your genetics, your mood, everything you've learned, etc. And then the situation has certain characteristics. Maybe you get provoked or maybe something, you get complimented or something. And these affect your insides. They affect your emotions, your thoughts, uh, and your physiological arousal. And then, of course, we know our thoughts and feelings can influence our behaviors. So let me show you a guy playing a violent video game. Now this includes some offensive language, no, a lot of offensive language. <clears throat> if you don't want to hear offensive language, you could step out for a minute now. I'm not going to force anyone to listen to it. All right. It goes on. <laughs> he's, he's actually talking to other people over the headset playing the same game. Now, if you asked him, what are you doing? You know what he's going to tell you? He's going to tell you he's having fun. <laughs> Does that look fun? He's going to tell you he's relaxing. Does that look relaxed? Could you see aggressive cognition? Could you see aggressive affect, emotion? Could you see aggressive physiological arousal? Yeah. 
But he's going to tell you it's relaxing and fun. That's interesting. This is a study we did with 607, 8th and ninth grade children. We measured them we, uh, about a bunch of things. We found that the kids who watched the most or played the most violent video games had what's called a hostile attribution bias. We all know people who, uh, when they get bumped or something annoying happens, they give the person the benefit of the doubt, right? They let it roll off their back. And we also know people who take it very personally. This is more like that second. Uh, you have a bias for attributing hostility towards other people's actions when something annoying happens. So uh, when kids play violent video games, in fact, you practice this the whole time you're playing a game, right? You practice a violent game, you're waiting for something to jump out and be aggressive towards you. Uh, and so you practice it and get better at it. Uh, kids who played more violent video games got in more arguments with teachers. There's a true real world antisocial behavior. They got in more physical fights. There's a real world aggressive behavior. And they got worse grades in school. Now, if you're a good skeptic, and I want you to be, you're going to say to me, Doug, that's not necessarily about playing violent video games. That might be about being a naturally hostile and aggressive kids. Because you know what? Naturally hostile, aggressive kids see the world in terms of hostility. They get in more arguments. They get in more fights. They get worse grades. And they play more violent video games. All of that is true. So in this study, we measured children's personality trait hostility. And if you split them into quartiles, you take the lowest quartile, least naturally aggressive kids, and they also play the least amount of violent video games, only 4% of them have been involved in a physical fight in the past year. That makes sense, right? They're not naturally aggressive. They're not playing violent video games. They're not getting into fights. But if you take these same low hostile kids and they play a lot of violent video games, it's an almost 10 times increase in their risk of getting into a fight. What about the other extreme? What if we look at the top quartile in, in hostility, the most naturally aggressive kids. If they don't play violent video games, 28% of them have been involved in a fight in the past year. And if they do, it's a bad combination. What we're seeing here is the stacking of risk factors. Yes, being a naturally hostile kid does matter. And so does playing violent video games. What matters more than either one of those is when you have them both together. But what really fascinates me is these middle two bars. Notice. The least naturally aggressive kids are more likely to get into a fight than the most naturally aggressive kids if these ones play violent video games. Now, in this study, we separated out how much time kids are playing from whether they're playing violent games or the, what the content is. And kids who spent more time were getting worse grades. But notice there's no direct path between amount of play and antisocial and aggressive behaviors. But because, because kids who play a lot tend to play more violent video games, those come together to increase their personality trait hostility, which in turn is related to all three outcome variables. But over and above that mediated pathway through hostility, if they're playing violent games, that gives an extra predictive kick to whether they're likely to get into physical fights. Parents tend to be concerned about one of two things, how much time their kids spend with media or what the content is. Data like this show they both matter, but they matter for different reasons. Amount seems to be related, if I go across all of the research, it's related with physical health, with sleep, uh, with risk of obesity, uh, with poorer school performance, with risk of addiction, things like that, but not aggressive behavior. Whereas violent content, content is related to behaviors, both aggressive and pro-social. So they both matter, but they matter for different reasons. Now the good news in this is that when kids said their parents checked the ratings before allowing them to get or uh, play games, those kids got into fewer fights, were getting better grades. Now again, if you're a good skeptic, you might say that's not necessarily about, being, uh, about checking ratings. That might be about just being a better parent. I don't care. <laughs> Why? Because you can't just tell people, be better parents. You have to tell them how. And here's a very specific how. There's a rating on the box. Learn it. Use it. Because it matters. And now they become more involved, better parents. Now, this again doesn't mean that violent games, the effects are all bad. Uh, here's, for example, uh, a fairly old game now called Unreal Tournament, where as you can see, it's a very complicated environment. There are things all around you in 360 degrees, above and below, and you have to run, and lots of moving people, and you have to keep track of them spatially. And uh, so it's a really complicated uh, environment. And one of my colleagues, Sean Green, hypothesized that if you practice with this type of game, it actually might improve your a number of perceptual skills. So I'll tell you about one of his studies. 
uh, where you have uh, people who either play these types of games or don't come in and, or actually he trained them, if I remember this study. He actually gave them 10 hours of practice with these games. Um, but you're looking at a computer screen with just like a little square in the middle of it just to, to tell you what to look at. And then you will see between 7 and 15 random letters. The letter only shows up for 15 milliseconds and then is blanked out for 85 milliseconds. Then there will be a white letter. Then you'll get eight letters after the white letter. Half of the time there's an X after the white letter. Here is your job. Is there or is there not an X after the white letter? You ready to do it? Here we go. Was there or was there not an X after the white letter? Yes, there was. And that's what we find is that if people play these types of games, they are much better at doing that very quick visual processing. They also do other types of, you know, they gain a bunch of other skills actually. So when you hear about this research, often you'll hear people claim that games are good because they improve these types of skills, or people claim they're bad because they can increase aggression. Uh, there's also a third group of skeptics who basically tell you, oh, there's no, no effect at all. Um, I tend to think that these are not really competing hypotheses. They could have the same, both could happen at the same time. They're different parts of the brain. And so we actually had uh, late adolescent males who all played a lot of video games, but half of them played this type of first person shooter game and the other half didn't. And we brought them in and we had them play a video game, sometimes with the violence turned on, sometimes with the violence turned off, and then we looked at what's happening in their brains. And Across all these gamers, uh, the, the violent game did seem to activate more cognitive control uh, because it matters more what you do if other people are shooting at you, so you pay you know, better attention perhaps. Um, but it didn't seem to influence their emotion regions of the brain, which is surprising. You'd think when the violence is turned on, you'd have these big surge in emotion areas of your brain. We had to split the two types of gamers apart. When you look at the gamers, and again, these are all high gamers. They just don't play this type of game usually. You look at their emotion areas of the brain, they're having a big reaction to it. When you look at the gamers who do play this type of game a lot, they're actively suppressing their emotion regions. You put them together, it looks like there's no effect. Active suppression of your emotion in response to it. What is that? Well, is that, the, is that desens evidence of desensitization? Is that the neural basis for which, des you know, which makes desensitization happen? Is it just a functional response? We don't really know quite how to interpret this, but it certainly shows there's not no effect. When we looked at their spatial attention processing skills, those parts of the brain, those uh, uh, were much better um, for the low violence gamers. They brought on lots of those resources, whereas the ones who normally played this type of game, they just showed no change from baseline. They're used to it, they didn't need to bring on extra resources to do it. So putting these together, I think this is evidence for both the aggression desensitization and the benefits to visual and spatial, spatial processing. Why? Because your whole brain is working all at the same time and you have to use all these skills at once. Uh, it does not support the Hypothesis, there's no effect, however. So, <clears throat> these are longitudinal latent growth curves. I show this to you to prove I'm smart. <laughs> uh, so now that I've said that, let's see if I can back it up. So, 3,000 kids followed for three years. The I means the intercept. At the beginning of the study, where did they start, how much they were playing violent video games, how much they're exposed to violent video games. The S is the slope, how much they changed over three years in their violent video game play. Down here, this is the intercept for aggressive cognition. We measured three types of aggressive cognition, hostile attribution bias, which you've already heard about, normative beliefs about aggression. This is how acceptable you think it is to behave aggressively when provoked. We all know people who you know, say you should always turn the other cheek, uh, and we also know people who say you should hit back harder, right? This is more like the second, that it, you think it's more acceptable to behave aggressively when provoked. And of course, in a violent video game, you're constantly getting reinforced for your aggressive responding. And the third type of aggressive cognition we measured in this study was aggressive fantasies. How much time you spent thinking about how you would like to hurt other people, and of course the entire time you're playing a violent video game, you're practicing an aggressive fantasy. And so then what we see is that 
Kids who played more violent video games at the beginning of the study also had more of these three types of aggressive cognitions at the beginning of the study. If they changed to play more violent video games, they changed to have more aggressive cognitions across the three years. Now, of course, how you think influences your behavior. And so the kids with more aggressive cognitions were more physically aggressive by year three at the end of the study. Uh, but over and above that, there's still this long-term pathway from way, starting way back that's still a significant predictor of their physical aggression. Let me show you or describe to you what this actually looks like because here's the subtlety. That kid who's been playing lots of violent video games, now he gets bumped in the school hallway. Because he's been spending time being hypervigilant for aggression, he stops assuming it was an accident. He starts assuming the other kid meant to make him mad or meant to do that, right? So another thing you do in a practice in the games, you quickly reorient your attention to something and you now try to call to mind a response. Now the thing humans do is usually the thing they think of first. It's called the availability heuristic. Uh, the thing you th do first or the thing that's most available is the thing you've practiced the most. In violent video games, you've practiced an aggressive response thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Not only that, because you've been reinforced for it, you also, that lowers the bar, making it seem more acceptable. So you get bumped, you stop assuming it was an accident, you quickly reorient your attention to the person, you call to mind a response, and the first thing that comes to mind is an aggressive response, and it seems like it's more, that's the right thing to do. You can see how the odds have changed in that school hallway. <coughs> Rather than just letting it go, the odds that he says something unkind or pushes back are much higher. And if he does that, then the odds the other kid's going to do something and it could turn into a full-fledged fight skyrocket, right? Here's the fascinating thing. If that fight happens in the school hallway, it looks nothing like what the kid was practicing in the game. No one will ever think it had something to do with violent games. Because kids aren't copying the aggression. What the games do is it changes the way you perceive the world and think. And you carry how you see the world and think with you everywhere and it colors all of your decisions. That's how media violence influences people. That's the reality of it. That's why it is a causal risk factor. And it's also why you'll never believe it. Because you think it's supposed to look like what they've been practicing. No! Humans aren't you know, little robots. But you somehow have forgotten that, even though you know it. Now, I claimed that media violence is best thought of as a risk factor. Here are seven uh, risk factors for aggression. We're predicting across the school year, from time one at the beginning of the school year to whether they've gotten into a physical fight by the end of the school year. If they have a hostile attribution bias, they are more likely to have gotten into a fight by the end of the school year than if they don't. If their parents are more, uh, less involved, uh, then they're more likely to get into a fight. If they like playing a lot of violent video games, they're more likely. If they have previously been bullied, they're more likely to get into a fight. If they're a boy, they're more likely to get into a fight across the school year. If they consume a lot of media violence, I believe in this study we measured TV, video games, and movies, uh, they, they are much more likely to get into a fight. And if they've previously been involved in physical fights, they, that's always the single best predictor of future fights. So media violence doesn't act differently from, it just increases the odds. But what matters more than any one of these is when you put them together. So if kids have none of these risk factors, they're at pretty low likelihood to get into a fight across the school year. And if they have one or two, that risk doesn't change much. Kids are resilient, they can handle a couple risk factors. You get to three, it starts seeming to change. You get out to four and it's over 50-50 now we can predict which kid's gonna get into a fight. You get out to having all seven of these risk factors and I have 94% accuracy predicting which kid will get into a physical fight this coming school year. Let me say that again. I can predict, I can do it with six at 94% accuracy. Six risk factors I can know with 94% accuracy which kids will get into a fight. If I drop it down to three, just are they a boy, have they been involved in fights before, and do they consume a lot of media violence? I have 80% ability to predict which kids will get into a physical fight. So this might suggest we should be doing bullying prevention really differently. Because right now you call them all into the auditorium and you give this fantastic presentation that no one pays attention to. Why is that? Well, because the victims know it's not aimed at them, they're the victims. Right? And the bystanders know, well, it's not them. The, they don't ever get involved in this. And even the bullies don't think it's about them. No one thinks it's about them. 
What if instead we profiled the kids at the beginning of the year, figured out who's at high risk, and we took those kids specifically in for a bullying prevention program? We might have a lot bigger effect at actually making some headway in bullying prevention. Now, <clears throat> this is my best way of trying to explain how aggression occurs. If we, this is my metaphorical aggression thermometer. Down here at the cold end, kids are always respectful and polite, right? I'm sure that's your kids. <laughs> and then as it heats up a little, they might be a little rude or have some aggressive thoughts. And, and only after that do they even start saying anything unkind ever. And then they might do relational aggression, which is your typically considered more feminine style of aggression, although boys do it about as much. This is like the, I'm having a party and you're not invited or ignoring you or telling or spreading rumors. These are using the relationship as a way of harming. Uh, then you might start having violent thoughts or pushing and shoving or threatening violence. And only at the really high end do you even hit someone, let alone at the most extreme uh, doing potentially lethal violence. No researcher is saying media violence is going to take a kid down here and push him to the top. None of us have ever said that. Media violence does not cause school shootings by itself. But in conjunction, let's take the killers at Columbine. Those kids had mental health problems. Those kids had uninvolved parents. Those kids had been bullied a lot. And they consumed a lot of media violence. So what was the cause? It's the wrong question. You can't answer that question. The cause is the set of risk factors and the lack of protective factors, because every protective factor is cooling it back down, which is why most of your kids can actually consume a darn, and you, by the way, can consume a darn lot of media violence, and you're never going to get as high as even hitting someone, right? Because you've got lots of protective factors cooling it down. So we might see these behaviors out of you, but we're never, unless you lose a bunch of protective factors or you gain some new risk factors, you're not going to get all the way up to physical aggression, which is why most people can say, I played these games all my life and I never shot anyone. <laughs> Duh. Uh, yet, uh, <laughs> you make the circumstances bad enough around you and it actually will come up as an idea that you've been re reinforced for as a possible solution. Um, now, if I'm right that the media are heating it up for all the kids, where would we see it? Would we see it in school shootings? No, we would see it in lower level aggressive behaviors. But we never think to look there. Well, let's look there. In 1998, which is one of the big school shooter years, by the way, there were 35 deaths in schools, and as horrifying as that number it is, is the, it's the tip of the iceberg. That same year, there were 257,000 times we got the kid to the hospital in time he didn't die. A million thefts or larcenies, a million and a half reported fights, and 18 million incidents of bullying. If we look, the effect is there. We just don't look there. We always take the most extreme thing, as if that should be the proper indicator. That's not where you should find the effect. You should find the effect at the lower level, kind of playground level, aggressive behaviors. And so even the critics of the media violence research, their own data still show the effect down at that level, but they always want to just point up here at lethal violence. <clears throat> so media violence in this culture seems to have achieved some type of special status where people either want to say, oh, think of the children, or they want to say, oh, there's no evidence at all. No, it's neither of those. It's not the doom, but neither is it unimportant. It acts just like every other risk factor. When it's present, the risk predictably goes up. When it's absent, the risk predictably comes down. So it doesn't deserve any special concern. But hopefully it can cool the rhetoric around media violence. Now, <coughs> you've started to hear about video game addiction. People actually have been talking about this since the 90s, which is when I started studying it. And I started studying it from uh, this place of very deep scientific skepticism. I thought all that means is you're saying, when you say your kid is addicted, you just really mean my kid spends a lot of time playing and I don't understand why. But a lot of time is not an addiction. In fact, you don't even ask how much people drink or do drugs to figure out if they're addicted. It's not about how much you do it. It's about what does it do to you. How does it damage your ability to function? And I thought there's no way games are having that effect. Uh, it turns out I was wrong. I'll show you the data <laughs> I collected that finally convinced me. But, you know, we've got lots of anecdotal data like this, right? <laughs> um, and, in fact, there are places where in, like in China where they're creating special texting lanes so you don't walk into other people. And really, just as you're driving into Lincoln, you might think, you know, characters like these have no harmful effect, but there was this guy in the back alleys there. <laughs> this is starting to be a very hotly studied 
area in the past decade. We find basically, depending on how you measure it, what the sample is, uh, what country is, somewhere between about 1 and 10 percent of kids would, of gamers would classify as addicted using a clinical definition of addiction. Um, and how do I know my research is having an impact in the world? Well, when Jimmy Fallon talks about it, he said, a new study shows that about one out of every ten kids who plays video games is addicted. You know what they really need is rehab. That rehab's such an awesome game. It's on Xbox and PlayStation. I played it for six hours yesterday. So, in 2013, the American Psychiatric Association included Internet Gaming Disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, that is the Bible for how we classify mental health disorders. It is in the appendix, which means the early research suggests there is a problem here. We need more research before we move it in as a diagnostic code. That said, World Health Organization just this year is poised to put gaming disorder in the ICD-11, the international, which is Europe's. DSM. So in the five years since they did it, it looks like the research is now clearer and the World Health Organization is about to classify it as a diagnosable disease. Um, how is it defined? Here is, these are the DSM style questions. There are nine questions, nine issues, uh, and in classic DSM style, if you say yes to five of them, you're in the club. So do you spend a lot of time thinking about games when you're not playing? This is showing cognitive salience, uh, can you, uh, do you get upset when you try to cut back, so that's withdrawal symptoms. Do you need to keep playing more and more uh, to get the same level of excitement, so that's tolerance. Uh, do you feel you should play less but you can't stop, so you are losing control. Have you lost interest in other activities, um, and so you're sacrificing other areas of your life for it. Do you keep playing even though you notice problems, like you're getting worse grades at school or you're not getting enough sleep? Uh, so even though you're seeing the problems, you don't stop. Do you lie about how much you do it? Uh, do you try to get away from your life by gaming and your personal problems? And have you risked or lost significant relationships, a job, or other career or educational opportunities? So you're actually, you know, this is serious long-term damage. So notice, all of these are based on dysfunction. They're not about how much you do it. None of them ask how much you do it. A lot of kids can play a lot and keep everything in balance. But there are some, about 8% of youth gamers, uh, who can't. So this is, again, 3,000 kids followed through for three years. And the cutoff for being addicted is this five symptom number. So across the three years, some kids started out addicted but stopped being addicted by the end of the study. Some kids weren't addicted at the beginning but they became addicted by the end. Some kids stayed addicted the whole time. And most of the kids, 82% or 92%, never reached that clinical level. This allows us to actually see what comes first and what comes second. Because people are always thinking, uh, well, maybe it's just a secondary problem. It's not a primary disorder. Uh, I myself kind of thought this, that maybe kids aren't doing well in school, they don't have a lot of friends, they get depressed, and they go home and they play games as a coping mechanism. We all do that, right? Uh, or we watch TV as a coping strategy. It's not a good coping strategy, right? Because it doesn't actually solve your problems. It's just a distraction method. So your problems get worse, usually. Uh, and so you don't, your school performance doesn't get better and you don't get more friends. And so they're more depressed, so they game more. So maybe the gaming is just a symptom of the real problem, which is depression. That's not what we found. We found that looking at wave one, the kids who were more likely to increase in their uh, pathological gaming symptoms were more impulsive at the beginning of the study, had lower social competence, and were spending more time playing games. At the end of the study, those kids who became, or who became addicted, their depression got worse, their anxiety got worse, their social phobia got worse, and their grades got worse. If they stopped being addicted at the end of the study, their depression lifted, their anxiety lifted, their social phobias lifted. It looked from this study actually like the gaming is leading the other mental health problems. Now, at one measurement, Per year, we can't really know what the timing is, but what this does show for me is they're at least truly comorbid, right? And we know this about mental health problems. You get one, you often get others. And then they sit there and they push each other and they make each other worse and it snowballs. And so if you walk into the you know, therapist's office and they just ask, what, which one started it? That does, that's the wrong question again. 
You have to look at the whole pattern. And that's the problem is at my university, we have lots of kids flunk out the first year. And if they bother to go to student counseling, they say their grades are bad. The therapist hears, oh, grades are bad, and asks grade relevant questions. How do you go to class? How do you take notes? Are you getting enough sleep? Uh, do you read the book? Uh, how do you study? Uh, therapists never asked about gaming. Right, because the patient didn't present with gaming as a problem. The patient never talks about gaming because to them, it's the solution. That's how they're coping. So no one talks about it and the kid flunks out because the real problem never got addressed. So we need to at least start asking about their media habits whenever we're talking about any other mental health issue. Now, it turns out that Maybe not everyone is addicted for the same reason, or maybe some kids are higher likelihood to become addicted. So maybe um, uh, what needs it satisfies for you matters. Um, and I'll talk about this one just briefly here. We have a, a, a new paper that's not yet published, but we did find, again, with two samples of college students, a thousand kids each, the kids whose um, Actually, I think I have data for this. <laughs> Forgot I added that slide. I'll tell you with, real, with a slide. But humans have three basic needs for what makes us intrinsically motivated to do something. They're an A, B, C. The A is autonomy. We want to feel like we're in control. The B is belongingness or relatedness. We want to feel like we connect to other people. And the C is competence. We want to feel like we're good at what we do. And if your job gives you those three things, you love your job. And if your job doesn't, you hate your job. And it really is kind of that simple. Uh, and so games are fantastic at all three of these. You're holding a controller, so you're in control. Uh, you can talk about games with your other friends. And if you play World of Warcraft, you can be online with 11 million of your closest friends at once. Uh, uh, and then, of course, a good, well-designed game teaches you to be competent. It starts off uh, simple and then gets harder and harder after it trains you how to be competent. And so some games actually may be better at meeting these needs, so might be a little more likely for kids to become addicted to them. But what we found, again, um, is that if you're getting your needs met in real life, you're less likely across two different samples of almost 1,000 students uh, you're much less likely to have addiction symptoms, but if you're getting these needs met in games, then you are much more likely to uh, have addiction symptoms. And so one of the things, I think the clinical implications of this, is that we can't just take the games away because they're meeting needs. That's just gonna leave a giant hole. You've gotta figure out what needs are being met by the games and give them another way to fill them. So if they're not getting their relatedness needs met in real life, you've got to put them on a team with other kids, or you've got to get them some other way to get that need met before you try to wean them off the games. Uh, yes, here is the coping stuff. So we hypothesize that uh, students who are spending more time uh, using games to cope with negative feelings were more, would be more likely to show addiction symptoms. But it would matter specifically if you actually had real reason to cope. Like kids who are higher in anxiety, and who might be high in anxiety is kids with real mental illnesses, and what, that we would see this media, you know, this statistically mediated pathway through coping. That's exactly what we found across four different uh, types of mental health problems: depression, borderline personality, obsessive compulsive disorder, and ADHD. To the extent that the kids had more of those, they had higher trait anxiety. They, if they used games to cope, they were much more likely then to show addiction <coughs> symptoms towards games. So this coping isn't necessarily a functional thing for them. Now you might say, well, that's because using media as a coping mechanism is a negative coping strategy, right? It doesn't actually solve the problem. So we measured it against all other negative coping strategies, and what we find is only two significant pathways, you know, from anxiety, they play more games, which re relates to more addiction symptoms, and if they use games to cope, not other negative coping strategies, specifically games to cope, then they again are more likely to have addiction symptoms. Study we just published recently, looking across three large samples in a couple of countries, and these are samples of thousands of kids again, um, if they have media in their bedroom, they consume more screen time and more violent content. By a year later, with most of these samples, the lag's a year, it's not 
true for all of them. Uh, some are like six months or a few months, but they were, you know, if they spent more time with screens, they were reading less, which predicts poor grades. They were getting less sleep, which predicts poor grades. They had higher uh, risk of obesity. They had greater addiction symptoms. Um, if they were consuming more violent content because they had uh, TVs or video games in the bedroom, then they had more normative beliefs about aggression and they showed more physical aggression three years later. What's interesting to me about this study is really geeky. Um, the main hypothesis for screen time is the displacement hypothesis, the idea that it's not just what, you know, why, does having a, why would a TV in a bedroom influence school performance? It's actually not clear why that would be, right? It's not, doesn't, shouldn't just make you dumber. In fact, TV can make you smarter, depending on what you're watching. So why does it have this? Well, maybe it's because they're reading less, or maybe it's because they're not getting enough sleep, or maybe, you know, those are, it's hard to measure what doesn't happen. That, you know, so we're saying other things get displaced by it. This study, for the first time in my knowledge, actually proves, yes, that is what's happening, is we actually are displacing some of these other activities. Now, if you figure out that media are influencing you, you need some help, are you likely to go get help? It turns out to the extent you watch more media, you're actually less likely to go seek help uh, because the media tend to portray people as crazy if they need help and no one wants to be seen that way and they tend to portray therapists of different stripes as unethical. We sleep with our clients and implant false memories, two for the price of one, I guess. Uh, and so, it, to the extent you consume more media, you're actually less willing to go get help when you even think you need it. Now, I'm going to finish with this because this is not one of those things of what you actually can do. Again, this is following kids across the school year. Four, 1,300 kids, we talked to the kids, we talked to their parents, we talked to their teachers, we talked to the school nurses. We got a lot of data on these kids. We find that the parents who, spend, who set limits at the beginning of the school year on amount and content of media. Has this ripple effect out into the future and out across a wide range of behaviors. So if they have, uh, they say they have rules on amount and content of what media children can watch, yes, those kids do spend less time with, uh, in front of screens and they consume less media violence, which in turn increased their sleep by the end of the school year, which in turn lowered their risk of obesity. They had better school performance at the end of the school year. They had more pro-social behavior as rated by teachers, which is remarkable because the teachers don't know what the parents' rules at home are, but they can see the behaviors in the classroom. And they were also less aggressive, again, as rated by teachers. Now, there are two things that fascinate me about this. The first is these are not the same type of outcome variable. That's physical health, school performance, and social wellness. Those three don't usually co-occur like that. Right? And yet this one simple thing of setting limits on amount and content of children's media influences all of them. But the really fascinating thing to me here on this is no parent will ever know they're having this effect. Because you're never going to know that your child gained less weight than he would have. You're never going to know your child's getting better grades than she would have, or less aggressive than he would have been. You only can ever know what your child is. And this is why parents feel powerless. All they see is the fight. They see the fight over the rules and they can't see the effect it has. And so they don't believe they're having an effect. No, nothing could be further from the truth. These data demonstrate that parents are in a much more powerful position than they realize, but they're never going to know it. And so then many of them give up the fight. Here's where I need you to go out to the communities you serve and make sure the parents understand that they are in this very powerful position if they use that power. And it's simple, setting limits on amount of media and content of media has this amazing protective factor effect across a wide range of health and wellness indicators. I'll let you guys take pictures of the slide since you seem to want to. And there's a little time for questions, I think. Is it the dopamine or Like all of us are so, like, maybe we would all be considered addicted in some sort of manner because we love it and it's, you know what I mean? Yeah, so the, the question's about dopamine. Well, technically, dopamine and serotonin are the only two things in the world you enjoy. Uh, so 
Uh, yes, of course, the dopamine and serotonin matter, and they do react, which is why you're drawn. You get that little text ding, and you, and you get a little dopamine surge, because now you're, something's exciting happened. Is that the same as addiction? Well, that's part of why we can become addicted to it, but it's not the same as addiction. And I would say most of you are probably not addicted because you're here today. You're actually being functional, you're, uh, and you're probably okay in your job. So addiction, again, come back. we use the term colloquially, we really shouldn't. It's a technical term that means unable to function in the real world. And if you use your media to help you function, then it's really not an addiction, it's actually benefiting you. So yes, you know, the, there are addictive pathways that all of us could react to. As, I, for me, it's about keeping it in balance. As the speaker before me said, you know, it's, it's about making sure it's not getting to that level where it's really dysfunctional. Harmoning your social functioning, your family functioning, your occupational functioning, your school functioning, your psychological functioning, your emotional functioning. Uh, and once it starts harming one or two of those, that's normal actually. What does it mean if you're harming one of those? It means you have something you like. Anything you love doing, you will sacrifice some other part of your life for. That's just truth. So one or two symptoms is not enough. If you love golfing, some days you might skip out of work a little early or refuse to do something with your partner on the weekend because you'd rather go golfing. Does that harm your relationship? Yeah. Does it harm your work? Yeah. But not enough to be clinically relevant. It's only when you're harming so many areas that then we really should be using that term addiction. Does that, does that help? There's a question back over here. I've scared her into submission. Other questions? If you have on TV while your kids are in the room, if they're playing, but they're not really watching it, but maybe they like notice something on TV, or is there, I guess, is there like direct relation? Say you have on yes, the news, is. right? And there's like something that comes on the news that your kid notices. So is it more like a, hey, don't watch TV until your kids are in bed? I'm going to let you make that, that value judgment, but I'll tell you what the data say. That even when you say your two-year-old is sitting there playing next to you and you have adult-directed TV on that doesn't seem to, they don't seem to care about it all, it disrupts their play. They do interrupt, so they're tra you're training them to be distracted from a very young age watching your things with them in the same room. Um, and, and of course, then you know, there's that other issue of content. You know, the news comes on and shows them something ter terrifying. And out of context, and all they're left with is that image. And the things that scare young kids up to about age eight is what it looks like. You know what that means for you as a parent? You're screwed. Because once they've seen it, they can't unsee it, and nothing you say can help. It's OK. It's just, no, it's in their head. There is nothing to do except hold them until they're done crying and wake up in the middle of the night with them when, until they stop having nightmares. So there's nothing you can do to fix it once they've seen it for young kids. Once you get to about age eight through 12, now what it looks like still scares them, but they're now also scared of real world potential problems like injuries, death, car crashes, tornadoes, things like that. And you see those on the news and now that scares them. And you can't even say, don't worry, it's not real, because it is. And you get out to age 13, and now abstract ideas like global warming and terrorism scare them too. So I would say, this is my personal opinion, this is not database, I try to be very clear, you know, what's science and what's my opinion. This is my opinion. Kids should never watch the news, ever. Probably not till they're 40. <laughs> And even then, you should probably have a parent with you to help explain it. <laughs> Other questions? Do you see any hope for this being able to get out into, even inside of all the money behind keeping it from being built? You know, it's. The question is, do I see hope for getting the real science out to the people who need it? Well, I need you to be my ambassadors, right? I've told you the science, you can help get it out. Um, 
I don't expect the news media are ever going to tell you the truth. And here's, here's an, I'll give you an anecdote that I think hides the deeper truth within it. So that Bar Barney versus Power Rangers video I showed you, that won a regional Emmy for the NBC affiliate in Minneapolis. So NBC corporate looked at that, said, hey, we want to do that for one of our national news magazines. I forget which it was, 2020-like show. And so a couple of young producers came out from New York. We got another group of kids. We did it again. Of course, it looks exactly the same every time you do it. And they went back to New York. And about a week before the show was supposed to air, we started getting this flurry of phone calls. I got sent on all sorts of weird errands. Go count how many references there are in the 1982 National Institutes of Health report on media violence, blah, blah, blah. Finally, we asked them, what the heck's going on? They said, well, legal got a hold of the story. And so we didn't even think the story was going to come out, but it did. It showed up, and these news magazines have nice long segments, about seven minutes long. For the first three minutes, it told you the story. It showed you the kids watching Barney. They play peacefully. They watch Power Rangers. They start punching and kicking, right? And then for the last half of the show, or this segment, it took this bizarre left turn, where now all of a sudden you're looking at these big books, and they say, but in 1982, uh, NBC commissioned a study that showed there's no evidence that violent television has any harmful effects. And then it went on, so it gave with the one hand and immediately took away with the other. A couple interesting things about that. They misanalyzed their data. When you analyze their own data correctly, it still shows the effect. Uh, but the more interesting thing is why do they do that? Why do they always end it saying, but we really don't know? And I believe, I'm not a legal scholar, but I believe that the minute they tell you the truth about the science, they now come under product liability laws. And now they've shown they have a faulty product and you can start suing them. So no, I don't think they'll ever tell you the truth. Or change them. I think they do change. Uh, I think they change in, I mean, why do you have 500 channels? Um, because some people want to watch other people own houses. <laughs> okay. I guess there's porn for everyone, you know? Uh, but, so I think they do change in response to what the audience will watch or would like to see. Um, the problem is, of course, the appetite effect. The more you see this type of stuff, the more you want to see it. So they've created this, it's not truly an addiction cycle, but they, it, it's like one. Uh, so that they make sure they never have too few customers for it. Yeah? Um, I have a hard time convincing parents of what you're saying. Is there any kind of a a handout that has some, you know, that looks like authority behind it. <laughs> <laughs> magic wand. Well, the magic wand, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the problem. We, as I said at the beginning, we don't want to believe it ourselves. You know, even though you came here kind of knowing what you were going to hear, you still didn't want to know it, right? Uh, and you still don't like knowing the truth. And when you tell it to other people, they really don't want to hear it. Um, and then there are big forces trying to bolster their side of it. So how do you fight that? How do you swim up that stream? I think some of it is to use their own statements against them. Um, so people say, well, I watched lots of this and it doesn't affect me. Really, it doesn't affect you. If you go to a movie or play a video game and it doesn't affect you, you have a special word you call it. What do you call it? Boring. Hello, you want to be affected by the media. Don't pretend you're not affected. You know, so if it really didn't affect you, you'd call it boring. Uh, for people who play violent video games, usually the men, you know, and you ask them what they like about it, they'll tell you, well, they like the adrenaline rush. That's interesting. That's actually accurate. It is adrenaline. It's adrenaline and noradrenaline and cortisol and testosterone. These are the glucocorticoids and catecholamines. That's the same cocktail of hormones you would drop into your bloodstream if I punched you right now. That's interesting. You know it's just a game, and yet your body's having a full-on aggression response. That's the effect. And you like that effect. Because normally when that cocktail of hormones is in your bloodstream, you're not enjoying what's going on. In the real world, if you've got those four in your bloodstream right now, you're being tortured. Or you're about to die. 
It's kind of fun to feel that when you're safe playing a game. And that's one of the reasons we like that effect. But then they pretend, oh, it doesn't affect me. No, that's it. That, that's actually increasing your aggression because you're actually body having an aggression response. So I think in some ways you can use what they say directly back to prove to them you want to be affected. Stop pretending you're not affected. Are there handouts? There are lots of them. Uh, you could go to the American Academy of Pediatrics website and get their policy statements that show in just two pages usually you know, what the state of the science is. You can go to my website and uh, download you know, papers if you want to bore them with statistics. Uh, but in a sense, the question becomes why do you watch it? And they're going to tell you a reason that shows you how invested they are and that's the effect. Right? It's increasing your serotonin and your dopamine. You watch a sad movie because you want to cry. You watch a funny movie because you want to laugh. You watch an aggressive movie because you want to feel amped up. That's it. It's not brain science. Oh, oh wait, yes it is. <laughs> I don't know if that helps, but that's a, st a starting place perhaps. It's just frustrating and you know you talk and talk and talk and you know kids are up all night and they tell you no they're not, they aren't. And yep. Yeah it's I mean it is a noble battle and it may be all our victories are going to be Pyrrhic but they're still worth having um, just because you know and I can't I can't speak for anyone else but myself you know I spend a lot of my days on interviews especially every time there's a school shooting and it's upsetting to me to f realize that my fame comes at someone else's blood um, but nonetheless you know if I can help I will so I sit there for an hour on the phone and the average quote in a newspaper is 12 words long the average quote on TV is eight seconds long I just gave you an hour of my time for eight seconds um, and when that starts feeling frustrating I remember, okay, it's whatever it is, you know, Washington Post. If a million people read it and 1% change what they do, I've just improved the outcomes for 10,000 kids. Okay, I will sit here and I will answer your questions. Um, so that's something I can do with my reach to the media. You can do the same thing in your communities. You know, it may be a smaller reach, but in some respects that may be better because you're probably better able to get more than 1%. <laughs> because you have that personal connection with your community. People do trust you uh, as a resource. So, uh, so you may be able to get 50% doing something different, and that's worthwhile. Is it frustrating? Yes. <laughs> I share your pain. I don't have a solution for that. Yes? This may be more of an opinion than any science. Cambridge Analytics is <coughs> conducted a massive amount of research. They know that affecting the levels of PJ's circle, you know, as far as community and the family and so on, that that affects, that's being spread all across the news and that affects our whole election process. This is affecting lives. There's multiple sided research, and yet nobody is saying anything about it. What do you see as the disconnect on why this whole thing with Cambridge Analytics is being so universally shown, and yet this research will just shove down the rug? So, the question so, Cambridge Analytics does political uh, opinion? Research is that is it? okay, and you can show that ads matter there. That you can influence elections this way or that way through social media, and we're getting a lot of airtime on that. But we're not get and uh, we're not getting it on this. Why is that? Um, I don't know. Is the correct scientific answer? Uh, if I were to speculate, I would say it's got to do with a lack of imagination. That in terms of how can we influence elections, there are lots and lots of ways to do that and that have been tried over hundreds of years. Uh, from lawn signs to negative ads to positive ads to influencing you know, the echo chambers we live in, etc. So if you take one of them away, they've still got a lot of other tools in their bag. If I take away sex and violence, 
what's left on TV? Oh yeah, other people buying houses. <laughs> uh, that's their main staple of the attention-based economy. How do we get you to look? How do we get you to stay looking? How do we get you to look over the commercial break? Uh, you know, sex and violence are the two big things there. And if we actually changed that, what would we put in their place? And that's unclear. What else would, you know, so I think there hasn't been, and, and those of you who are fourth grade teachers, I'm gonna criticize you right now. Stop telling kids conflict is the center of drama. That's not true. Or it is true, but it's wrongly interpreted. So what you think of as conflict is fighting. So that's why there's all this fighting and violence on TV. But that's not actually the conflict you have in your real world lives. All the, you have a lot of conflict, but it's all because there was a mistake or you had different goals or people had different opinions or they didn't notice the same thing or they didn't have the same information to begin with. There's almost no children's literature that does that. Winnie the Pooh, Paddington Bear, and almost nothing else. Harry Potter, as much as I love those books, they're all basic good versus basic evil. Why do we teach kids that idea? It's a failure of imagination. What else could there be if we don't, have, if we don't mean drama is fighting? What is it? And so all these writers grow up thinking they have to make their characters hate each other and fight each other and have bad intentions and hostile intentions. In fact, almost all of the drama in your lives, none of it has hostile intent. No matter how bad your fights are with your mom, your dad, your spouse, or your kids, it's almost never because you really wanted to hurt the other person. So then what is drama? What is, you know, is it something really different? So I think it's, from my point of view, it's really a failure of imagination. Writers don't know what else to do besides have people fight. I've shocked you all into silence. <laughs> Last question. If there were, is there a place where I can guide myself as a parent or other parents where you can see like the level of aggression or violence yeah. in? Yeah, so the speaker before me mentioned commonsensemedia.org. That is one place that does have these. There's screenit.com, I think. There's, oh shoot, what's the name of another one? Um, I mean, there are various rating uh, bodies that are not the, med not the official ratings. Even the official ratings are better than no information. I mean, how many of you know all 11 symbols of the TV rating system? <coughs> what the hell's wrong with you? Why don't you know them? <laughs> Well, because they're designed to be confusing, that's why. They're designed so you won't use them. All the ratings are bad so that you won't use them. Well, there's screenit, I think .com might be .org. There's kids in mind, that's another one. Probably also .org, there's common sense. But on TV, there's the little rating symbol. You've got a V-chip, was one for you in the 1996 Telecommunications Act. How many of you use it? I know the answer. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, and then there's rating on the video games, there's ratings on movies. The movie ratings are really bad. If you even bother to go to the content, they say things, this is rated R for some language. What the heck? Okay, it's not a silent film. What the hell does that mean? It's, a really, it's really useless if you're a parent trying to use the, the ratings effectively. And so the, the, the validity studies of the existing ratings show they are really bad. Uh, and that's why parents don't use them, but still it's better than nothing. So if you do nothing else, use the industry ratings. But then there are these other people who actually provide really uh, detailed ratings. Oh, my very favorite for movies is Movie Mom. Um, Movie Mom, I think she's .com. Uh, she not only tells you what age different movies are good for, she then gives you a bunch of questions that you should ask your kids after it. Um, and I didn't really tell you the, the research on this. There are four types of parental monitoring. There's co-viewing or co-playing, so you sit and watch with your kids. There's restrictions on amount, there's restrictions on content, and then there's what's called active mediation, where you sit and you talk with your kids about what they're seeing and hearing. Um, it turns out three of these are really good for kids and one's actually bad. 
Sitting and watching with your kids actually enhances all the negative effects. Why? Because now you're giving tacit approval to whatever is being seen on the screen. That is unless you do the active mediation. If you sit and watch and you discuss it with them, then that mitigates all the negative effects. Let me say that again. If you sit and you watch with your kids and you talk about it, it mitigates all of the negative effects and enhances the positive effects. Now here's the trick. You don't know how to do it because you haven't been trained in this. And so usually when parents do this, they do really poor, low level. They, they give their opinions. I don't like that. I do like this. That's really bad active mediation. Act good active mediation is done with questions. In this show, this person shot this person for this plot reason. But have you ever seen a situation like this at school? How did they really handle it? What would be the best way to handle a situation like this? What would be the worst way? Huh, TV showed you the worst way. Why? Get them to understand that what they're seeing in their media is not there because it's real, it's there because it will keep you watching. And when you do that level, whose point of view is being shown? Whose point of view isn't being shown? You know, all these critical viewing questions, that mitigates all the negative effects of the media. It also, there's not good science on this. I've heard it from enough people anecdotally that I believe it's probably true if we could figure out how to study it. But when you have this pattern of talking with your kids about what they see and hear, and especially if you can start it from a young age, at some point your kid's gonna go over to Johnny's house and see something you never in a million years would have let them watch. What happens? They come home and they tell you about it. And you now still have the opportunity to do that questioning with them to help them understand it the way you want them to. So, this is the single best thing you can do. It's hard, though, especially if your kids are already teenagers and you haven't done it before. Um, it's hard to get them willing to do it, but it's still worth it. But even if you're not willing to do that, limits on amount, limits on content, as you saw, very powerful effects all on their own. So thank you very much. I hope this was useful for you.